Greetings VFI supporters and anyone else watching this video. I'm Lirania L. Snyder sitting in this week for my dad Barry Siegel. The big story this week is Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's trip to the U.S., his address to a joint session of Congress and his meeting with President Biden and Donald Trump. Another big story is the absence of Vice President Kamala Harris from his speech before a joint session to Congress and what was going on back in Jerusalem while he was out of the country. Finally, of course, there's the ongoing military conflict with Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and ultimately Iran, while Israeli athletes make their way to Paris for the Olympics. All of that and more is just ahead on this week's edition of VFI News from Israel. On Wednesday evening, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu gave his fourth address to a joint session of the U.S. Congress, which is extraordinary in itself, as few world leaders have ever made such an address more than once, much less four times. Netanyahu's arrival in Washington at the height of election season meant he needed to be very careful to avoid giving an appearance of taking sides in the U.S. presidential race. He actually managed to do that fairly well, thanking President Biden for his support to Israel during the current war, and then later in his address thanking former President Trump, who is the Republican candidate for president in the upcoming election, for brokering the Abraham Accords. Most of the address was devoted to a review of how the war against Hamas in the Gaza Strip got started, with the Hamas massacre of October 7, 2023. He introduced some of the Israelis sitting in the gallery, including rescued hostage Noah Argamani, who represented the hostages Hamas kidnapped into Gaza on October 7th. He also introduced IDF soldiers who have fought in Gaza. His main theme for the address was the broader war on terror in the Middle East, in which he accused Iran as the main sponsor and instigator. He reminded his audience that one of the first things the regime which currently rules in Iran did when it came to power in 1979 was to take staff members of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran hostage. It then instigated a series of hostile acts against the U.S. which continues to the present day. Israel will always remain America's indispensable ally, he declared. Iran sees America as its greatest enemy. For Iran, Israel is first, America is next. When we fight Iran, we are fighting the most radical and murderous enemy of the United States, Netanyahu continued. He added that when Israel confronts Iran and engages in efforts to prevent it from obtaining nuclear weapons, we are not only protecting ourselves, we are protecting you. Our enemies are your enemies. Our fight is your fight. Our victories will be your victories. He added that victory in the battle against Hamas is close, hinting that there might need to be another battle against Hezbollah not long afterward. For all of this, Netanyahu said, it would be very helpful for the U.S. to fast-track supplies of weapons, ammunition, and military equipment to Israel so it could finish the job. He also proposed that Israel and America's allies among the moderate Arab states join a formal pact to confront Iran, which he said would be called the Abraham Alliance. Another point he made, which is sure to get a lot of people's attention, is when he addressed anti-Israel protesters, some of whom were at that very moment demonstrating against his visit to Washington in the streets outside the Capitol building. Netanyahu said that despite the righteous anger many of these protesters say is fueling their actions, the truth is that they are standing up for murderers and rapists, declaring that they should be ashamed of themselves. Netanyahu had more to say about the anti-Israel protests, declaring that Iran has been funding them and otherwise stoking the fires of anti-Israel sentiment all over the Western world. He added that these protesters, in addition to being naive and hypocritical, were also serving as Iran's useful idiots. The term useful idiots is attributed to Soviet leader Vladimir Lenin, and it means a person who naively believes they're supporting a righteous cause, but they're really just being used by some nefarious actor to advance an agenda they have little or real understanding of. Apparently Netanyahu thought it was appropriate to use in this context, and I agree with him. He also mentioned the politicization and weaponization of the International Criminal Court, saying that if the ICC is allowed to tie Israel's hands so that it cannot effectively fight terror, the U.S. military would be next in line to have its hands tied. 
In this context, he thanked those members of Congress sitting in the room who had spoken out against this. He made a few other important points, but this last one deserves to be expanded upon because there were 70 Democrats and one Republican member of Congress who boycotted this address. There was also someone who ordinarily would be in the room to actually preside over such an event, but that individual was potentially absent. I'm talking, of course, about U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris, who is the presumptive Democrat candidate now that President Joe Biden has announced his exit from the race. House Speaker Mike Johnson, who ended up presiding over the event in Harris's absence, led a chorus of criticism for her decision to skip it in favor of a campaign event in Indiana. You want to be the leader of the free world, and yet you can't bring yourself to sit behind our most important and strategic ally in this moment. That is not a good look for you, Johnson said. However, to be fair, I need to mention that Ohio's Republican Senator J.D. Vance, who is Donald Trump's running mate and potential vice president, also did not attend this address due to his campaign schedule. Be that as it may, Netanyahu is scheduled to meet Harris, Biden, and Donald Trump on Thursday and Friday before returning to Israel. I'm sure there'll be some things to report to you about those meetings in next week's broadcast. But for now, we're almost halfway through this week's report and there's a lot more to tell you. So I'm going to move quickly through the major news stories. Wednesday evening saw IDF troops carrying out a raid to recover the remains of four hostages kidnapped into Gaza on October 7th, 2023. The dramatic raid occurred as the negotiations over the return of the remaining hostages and a long-term ceasefire are ongoing in Qatar. There are many questions hanging over those negotiations and the Israeli delegations announced on Wednesday that their arrival in Qatar will be delayed until next week. This has led to accusations from the political opposition in Israel that Netanyahu is dragging his feet due to political consideration. Speaking on a personal note, I really hope that's not what's going on, but I'm afraid I can't be entirely sure at this point. In other news related to the war in Gaza, Egypt is reported to be moving closer to signing off on a new plan to allow Israeli forces to remain in control of the Philadelphia Corridor, which marks the border between Egypt and Gaza. The IDF has largely succeeded in cutting off the supply of weapons, ammunition, and other contraband through the smuggling routes over and under this border. And the IDF says it must remain in control of the border in order to ensure that these smuggling routes are not reactivated. This is the only way to ensure that Hamas does not rearm itself in order to fight Israel again in the future. It's also important to mention that the IDF has discovered dozens of tunnels running under the border since taking physical control there earlier this year. Referring back to the negotiations over the end of the war, Hamas is demanding that the IDF withdraw from the border as one of its opening demands. Also noteworthy this week was the IDF's re-entry into the city of Khan Yunus, which it withdrew from in May after having cleared it out of Hamas presence. Hamas managed to infiltrate back into the city in force, however, and have been trying to reassert themselves there, making it necessary for the IDF to go back in. This pattern has been seen in other areas of the Gaza Strip as well in recent weeks and is likely to continue for some time. Switching to Israel's northern border, Education Minister Yoav Kish had some bad news on Tuesday. He said that it is unlikely that residents of the border communities who have been living as internally displaced refugees since the start of the war will be able to return to their homes in time to start a new school year on September 1st. He made this statement in a meeting with leaders of northern communities in which he also called on the IDF to attack Hezbollah to push them back away from the border and allow the residents of these communities to return to their homes. These sentiments have been echoed by many other political security officials in Israel, as the situation obviously can't go on like this permanently. Hezbollah, for its part, continues to shower the Galilee with rockets, anti-tank missiles, and UAVs. This gives weight to the demands that they be pushed away from the border, or better yet, destroyed entirely so that Lebanon, as well as Israel, will be permanently freed from their reign of terror. This last week saw a drone fired by the Houthis in Yemen hitting a residential building in Tel Aviv just a few hundred meters away from the U.S. and British diplomatic missions. This prompted the Air Force to launch a retaliatory raid on the Houthi-controlled port of Hudaydah in western Yemen, causing massive damage. 
However, the Houthis defiantly declared that they won't be deterred and in fact are planning to increase their attacks on Israel. We will almost certainly have more to report about this going forward. Before moving on though, I need to mention that this strike on the Houthis carries a strong message to everyone in the region, both friends and foes of Israel. The port of Hudaydah is 1800 kilometers from Israel quite a bit further than the Iranian port of Bandar Abbas, which most military analysts believe would be a primary target for Israel in the event of war. Once again, both friends and enemies of Israel are sure to take note of the ability of the Israeli Air Force and how they just demonstrated their ability. Speaking of demonstrations and drama, National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gvir is in the news this week for all kinds of reasons. It starts with his remarks in the Knesset plenum on Wednesday to the effect that the status quo on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem's old city has been altered to allow Jewish prayer there. This bold and certainly memorable declaration was met with angry protests from across the political spectrum. It's important to mention that the Prime Minister's office was quick to issue a statement that the status quo on the Temple Mount has not changed and there are no plans to change it. Defense Minister Yoav Gallant took that a step further, calling Benkville a pyromaniac who wanted to set the entire Middle East on fire. He added that he will vigorously oppose Ben Gvil's ambitions to be included in any group of senior advisors that will have power to make decisions regarding the ongoing war. Arya Deri, who leads the ultra-Orthodox Shas party in the Knesset, made a similar statement this week amidst an escalating feud between him and Ben Gvir. Legislation important to Shas has been delayed by Ben Gvir in an attempt to put weight behind his demand to be given a greater role in the decision-making process, and Deri has adamantly refused to back down in the face of these tactics. In a statement praising Deri for opposing Ben Gvir's inclusion in a potential war cabinet, Opposition MK and former IDF Chief of Staff Benny Gantz said instead of holding discussions on his inclusion in the narrow security decision-making forum, he should be stripped of all decision-making authority on sensitive security issues. Well, friends, there's a lot more to say on this topic, but we're out of time for this week's report, and I want to continue the tradition of ending with some good news. Israel's delegation to Summer Olympics in Paris is the second largest ever and includes at least nine athletes who the coaches say have a serious chance of bringing home a medal. The Israeli delegation brought home four medals from the Tokyo Olympics in 2020, and hopes are high that this time the total could be even higher. We'd like to wish the Israeli Olympic team the best of success and thank them for their courage they're showing by representing our country at the Olympics despite the hostile atmosphere Jews and Israelis are facing all over the world these days. Thank you for watching. I'm Lirania L. Snyder, and this has been another edition of VFI News from Israel. <music>